I should have been a pole dancer. Very Head to the don't go, baby! What did the deep rasper say to the me? I don't know. Smash! Long time no see, y'all. It's been a minute. I hope everybody's doing good. If you're new, um, what's good? And I've been trying to find a game series that I really rock with, that has mechanics that I really like, and replayability where I can just keep replaying the game because the mechanics are just that good. I tried diving back into the Souls series, I used to be a fan of it, however I wasn't really feeling it for most of the games, I feel like Souls games always make you fight everything on their terms. Then those games feel super restrictive. Then I thought about my enormous backlog of games to play. Then I thought about games I wanted to play like Nier Automata. I wanted to replay God of War Ragnarok and its DLC. I need to finish Cyberpunk so I can even get to the DLC. I want to get Baldur's Gate 3. I wanted to play the whole Mass Effect series and I wanted to play Dragon Age 2. And those are really long RPGs which, let's keep it a bean, I really don't have time to play. So I like fighting games and a game I decided to revisit was Bayonetta. And I did play Bayonetta a long time ago when it was a free game on Xbox Live. And I did think it was one of the best beat em ups I ever played. However, I will not lie, I found Bayonetta 1 to have a lot of annoying parts, a lot of cheap stuff, a lot of annoying enemies. Some of these enemies had me like, A couple of these enemies were just really annoying, especially the guys with the claws, Grace and Glory, and then their advanced forms, Gracious and Glorious. They're so annoying, they be breaking your combos, they don't be getting witch time sometimes. I swear they only get witch timed if you have the accessory Selene Light or you do a perfect prairie on them. Just look at the anatomy of these cheating bums. Disgusting. Then you have these griffin like things called Fearless, which have an annoying bite attack that comes out fast. And one of my biggest gripes with this game when I first played it is how some of these verses just start off with an insta attack. Damn, I was wiping my hands off. Hey yo! This game, I swear. So those enemies were some of my biggest gripes when I first played Bayonetta. And they were the reason on my first playthrough playing this game while I got so many stones bronze and silvers and i used to wonder to myself how in the world do you get gold plat and pear plat in this game with all the cancerous things that this game throws at you and if you use healing items they deduct your score so much that you can't use healing if you want a good score then when i played this game i unlocked all the basic hand-to-hand -hand techniques but then when you beat the game you look at the shop and there's all these accessories and they were worth so much money at least a hundred thousand halos or more on my first playthrough i'll admit that i didn't even really experiment with the weapons that much i pretty much used hand to hand and the katana considering the grapes i listed before i never really wanted to revisit bayonetta 1 but i was always down to revisit bayonetta 2 because that game was really fun so i decided to replay bayonetta and in this playthrough i wanted to get at least a gold on every chapter on normal and hard and after completing this I have so much love for this game replaying Bayonetta gave me a whole bunch of more respect for the game than it already had and it truly is one of the best beat-em-ups to ever exist it is the best beat-em-up I've ever played I like Bayonetta so much, I went back and replayed Bayonetta 2 and bought 3 and played them all. At the time of this video, I already completed Bayonetta 2 on hard, getting all golds. And I'm currently working on Bayonetta 3 on normal. Why my chapter ratings look like a Florida man flexing those pearly golds? <laughs> Anyways, let's get into how Bayonetta saved me from modern gaming. Bayonetta is a very classic arcadey type of game. It drops you in a level, you throw some hands, oosh, 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 oosh. you find the challenge areas called Alphimes, you do them if you want, and you proceed. And you receive an overall grade for the chapter as well as each individual burst. 
Bayonetta is not the type of game where you're gonna have 60 hours of cutscenes and you have to do all these side quests, venture across a big open world, lose a lot of time IRL to unlock abilities and cosmetics. In Bayonetta, you do the level, you take your money, you cash out. You buy what you want or you buy what you need, which is great because the game wants you to focus on the mechanics. And I personally believe that mechanics are the number one most important element to gaming. How well does the game play? How engaging are the mechanics? Does it complement what you're doing? Does it challenge you? How responsive are the controls? Can you play as you want? Etc. Furthermore, Bayonetta is triple S tier when it comes to the mechanics. Gameplay as well as replayability. You heard what I said, triple S tier. The beauty in Bayonetta really comes when you challenge yourself to get good rankings. For this playthrough, as I mentioned, I have to get at least golds on normal and hard, which is going to force me to actually master the mechanics and fully understand them. My experience getting all golds was very challenging at times, yet so fulfilling once I got it done. And the reason why it was so fulfilling is because the game plays so smooth and good. I had to understand the mechanics down to the micro level and execute it right. And the controls and the way the game played was just smooth and fun. In comparison to a game I recently played, Dark Souls 3, where all your attacks come out slow, the dodges come out slow, the prairie's not working, you can't cancel your attacks. I just don't feel like I have full control over my character and its movement like I do for characters that are in action games. I must mention that when you first play Bayonetta, you do not have all your accessories and abilities unlocked. You will have to play the game and get some money to unlock all your basic hand-to-hand -hand techniques. And you will need a lot of cash to go ahead and buy those accessories, which are very important to actually getting good ranks in this game. So on this playthrough I mentioned in this video, I already had all my basic hand-to-hand -hand techniques unlocked, and I had a little bit of money to buy some accessories. I think the only accessory I used on my very first playthrough of this game was Selene's Light. In this game, Bayonetta has a plethora of weapons that you can use. Some of these weapons can be attached to Bayonetta's hands or her feet, so you can dib and dab to make some cool combinations and some very damaging combinations. And some of these weapons actually have properties that are very important. For example, let's take chapter 3. This chapter starts off with flaming angels, and you can't just start dwelling on these angels. You have to wait till they attack and you witch time them so you can attack them without them consistently burning. But what I found out from trying to go this level for so many times is you can actually use the fire Duragas and it lets you attack them whenever you want because the property of the fire weapon is fire. Now you don't have to wait for them to attack which could be very annoying at this chapter to be honest. And now that I'm looking at this in hindsight I realize we actually have a few more options. We could taunt the enemy so they attack us more often or we can use the gaze of despair which is an accessory that is worth 100,000 halos, which automatically puts enemies in a rage state. And the benefit of that is they attack more often, giving you more chances to parry or witch time. Might want to be careful with them gaze of despairs though, some of them enemies might knock your ass out if they hit you. With that rage damage, I wasn't a big fan on some of the weapons that I bought and I used on my first playthrough. However, now that I replayed the game again, I definitely found out which enemies are weak to what specific weapons. I wasn't a big fan of the whip, however, I found out that the whip actually destroys the claw enemies, which I hate. You're able to grab them with the whip and swing them around and damage all the other enemies in the radius, which is super good. I still don't like the fire Duraga, but I do like the electric Duraga, which allows you to attack really fast and it's just super stylish too. Then I unlocked the weapons that I didn't even know were in the game on this playthrough, like the nunchucks that got my girl Bayo swinging them chucks like Bruce Lee. Then we have these rocket launchers, and they are a great leg attachment as they have helped lay down so much damage on some of these enemies. Since we're talking about weapons, we might as well dip into accessories. 
And one of the most important accessories in this game is the Moon of Kala, which gives you the ability to prairie. It is the most important accessory in my opinion, however I do believe pairing should be already baked in your default moveset. Now let's remember, one of my biggest gripes when I first played the game was how many verses start off with an insta attack. Now with the Moon of Kala equipped, you're able to parry that attack, even if it's a projectile. As long as you know that that verse is going to start off with an insta attack, or you are actually ready. If you happen to perfectly time your parry, you will do a counter attack very similar to the Makiri counter in Sekiro. And parrying works by flicking your stick in the direction of the attack. So you don't just press the button, you have to know which direction the attack is coming from. So furthermore, Bayonetta is a game that has a punch button, a kick button, a button dedicated to shooting her guns, and you can do a perfectly timed dodge with the right trigger to initiate which time, which slows everything down. It's really Bayonetta moving super fast, beating that ass, but y'all know what I mean. You can hold down the kick button to extend your attacks or the punch button to extend your attacks. And just like fighting games, for some of the combos, you will have to take a brief pause during the middle of it to initiate the rest of the combo. These combos are launchers or they end in hard knockdowns. A feature I really like in this game is Bayonetta allows you to have two weapon sets and during mid combo you are able to switch to the other weapon set and finish out the combo. Allowing you to pull off some Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance stance change combos type shit. And during bosses using those stance change combos can lead to some crazy huge damage on some of the bosses. A common strategy that I use in this game is to pull off a big combo and to finish off a strong enemy, finish it off with a torture attack. Bayonetta has meter and her meters are displayed by orbs of magic. You at least need one orb of magic to do which time for a short amount of time. The more orbs you have, the longer it goes. Meter is built by finishing combos, timing, or a well-timed dodge. It costs at least three orbs of magic to do those wicked weave attacks. Now you're able to swing those obelisk the tormentor hands and I believe getting hit causes you to lose four orbs of meter, at least on hard it does, I don't know about normal. Once you have a full row of orbs you're actually able to perform a torture attack and these torture attacks are going to kill most basic enemies or do huge big damage to stronger enemies and the other benefit will be you pick up their angel weapon. And most angel weapons I would say are pretty strong. And the beautiful thing about Bayonetta is all the mechanics I just mentioned you're able to piece together in a very methodical manner that's just very satisfying to complete. So I previously mentioned how Bayonetta has triple S tier replayability. So on the background of this game's replayability, I remember when I played the game, I was up until chapter 9, and there was three chapters that I could not get a gold rank. And the chapter I want to elaborate on the most is chapter 3. And as I mentioned earlier, chapter 3 had you deal with the fire-covered enemies, and it took a while to figure out how to deal with the enemies in the best way. Then you had to fight two fearless enemies which were really annoying with that fast bite attack, especially when the camera angle does not allow one of the fearless to be seen and next thing you know they're biting your ass. Or the verse starts off with a think fast flaming balls to the face attack. Then you're taking too much damage and then for that verse you end up with a bronze or silver. Then there was times where I found myself taking damage to lava in some very goofy ways. I replayed chapter 3 on normal so many times and in the process I remember fighting some of the enemies I would figure out how to isolate strong enemies from the other ones due to the combo you would use. Or to use launcher combos and try to extend them to the point where other enemies on the ground wouldn't come up to hit you and you combo the enemy in the air to death. And I remember during this playthrough I would go to the main menu when I would take too much damage on a verse to reset the checkpoint. But I stopped doing that even when I took too much damage on a verse or my overall score for the level was not gold because I would take the halos after beating the level and upgrade my accessories and abilities 
and gain foresight for the whole level and understand what to do on each verse to return to the level to do better. Which me realizing that is me realizing that Bayonetta has tons of replayability and Bayonetta really wants you to master its gameplay by understanding and discovering and mastering its mechanics. Which is partially done by buying accessories. This realization I had gave birth to a mindset where it changed my approach to the game. When I would play a new level, I did try to goad it off the first attempt, not gonna lie. But I wouldn't put all that pressure on myself and I would just play the whole level out even if I didn't goad it because understanding the enemy arrangement and developing a strategy for the enemies to finally execute that strategy, it's what's gonna give me the gold rank. For example, let's take chapter 15, Tower of Truth, a level where you fight all the previous bosses and it's pretty much the ultimate challenge to see how far you've grown as a player. Furthermore, as you can see, I'm fighting Gracious and Glorious, the annoying White Claw Doragos. So I previously attempted this level, I deliberately know that they are right there, and I specifically plan to kill the Dorago with the Fire Claws. What a torture attack, so he drops his claws. And I pick up his Fire Claws to easily kill the other Dorago. There's tons of sections where the gameplay is very challenging, which you can use different accessories to really make that section very easy for yourself. As you can see in this chapter, which is Broken Skies, I used the clone technique to completely obliterate that mini boss. And once you experience one of these levels once, and you go back to it again, you are easily able to develop these strategies to get that gold rank or higher that you've been dreaming about. Bayonetta offers replayability outside of just challenging yourself for a good rank. Playing the game on normal and hard is different because the arrangement of the enemies will be different, even in the Alfheim challenges. One thing I really like about Bayonetta is the freedom on how you want to play the game. There's enough weapons and accessories to complement your playstyle on how you want to play. But you have to understand how the mechanics, weapons, and accessories work. It's not one of those type of games where, oh, you can only attack after the boss does this. You can only do this when this happens. It is not a formatic, mundane game where you're waiting for an opportunity to attack. You create your opportunities in Bayonetta. You do not have to remember attack strings. You can interrupt attack strings. You can witch time out of them. You can jump out of them. You can turn into a bird and fly out of them. This game has movement and spacing. It's not slow and clunky. You make enemies in this game fight on your terms. Your moves come out as soon as you press the button in a fast manner. The only time I felt like Bayonetta did not give players freedoms to complete something their way was the Alfheim challenge where you had to stay in the air for 30 seconds. In addition to Bayonetta's greatness, I wanted to talk about strategies that you develop by playing the game a lot and by redoing chapters to get a good rank. Something I really noticed by playing this game is certain combos with certain weapons really hit enemies really hard and you're able to just stun them or you're able to use wicked weave attacks and you're able to just stomp on them randomly to stop them from even attacking from distance. I would say in Bayonetta, the Alfheim challenges are definitely where your strategy development will occur the most because some of those challenges were just straight up bonkers. Over my course of playing Bayonetta, I realized that sometimes you just don't go into these challenges straight up trying to fight and destroy everything, there's better methods to do to get the job done. And when you develop these strategies, you kind of realize that you're puzzling by gameplay. For example, there's an Alfheim challenge where you're fighting flaming angels. This challenge was actually hell. You can't even get touched by an angel. So I could combo everybody with the flame Doragas, but they're slow and I really don't like them. So the method I use to do something like this is what I call playing off meter. The first thing I need to do is build meter. How do I do that? I start taunting the enemies to build meter. 
So once I build enough rows of meters, then I use a torture attack on an angel and I use the angel weapon, specifically the staff because the radius of it is just so big. Now all of a sudden for this Alfheim challenge, tining becomes a core mechanic I need to do to beat it. Now using this strategy makes me realize that this challenge is not actually hell, I just needed to develop a great strategy to do it. And eventually when I would run into these challenges that were similar to this one, I would use the same strategy and I would also equip the accessory that when you dodge, you leave that skull that blows up. And as I mentioned earlier, when you play Bayonetta, you kind of puzzle by gameplay. But one thing I realized for some of the Alphine challenges that make you have limited punch and kicks, that sometimes it's not even finding the appropriate combo to destroy the enemies on the screen. Sometimes it's just destroying one enemy and getting the angel weapon and using the angel weapon against the other enemy and that's it. Now I know I've been slurping this game off talking about how good it is. On the contrary, we need to talk about what I think the flaws of this game were, which this game does have flaws. It wasn't apparent to me when I first played the game on normal, however, when I played the game on hard, I started to notice how the camera actually messes you up. There's times where enemies aren't immediately seen around you and they're outside of your camera angle and they do an attack, you don't see them coming and then you get hit. This is very apparent once you're doing the Alfheim challenges. There's nothing more annoying than whooping ass than having an enemy spawn that you didn't even know spawned and then they're doing an attack that just charges across the map and you don't see them in your field of vision. When this would happen to me, what I would do is I would just take some steps back and then lock on to the nearest enemy to get all the enemies in my field of vision. Similarly to this issue is another issue I have when enemies crowd around each other and they attack around the same time as their attacks are being swung through each other, which makes you try to parry or witch time randomly, which doesn't even really work. Then you have the enemies blocking your character's body so you can't even see. It's just a mess, really. It doesn't happen often, but it is very evident in Alfheim challenges. Bayonetta 2 actually addresses these issues by giving the player an option to zoom the camera out to their liking or in if you're trying to get close to the sweeter things. While playing this game, you will realize how strong the pole dance attack is, and a flaw I realize in this game is sometimes enemies do not be getting stunned by the hit animation. It really doesn't happen often, but when you're doing an Alfheim challenge and your strategies depending on the pole dance attack, it's annoying when an enemy walks through it and hits you. But I will say you can jump out of it to cancel it, but I'm not sure if you can instantly prairie or which time. Actually, you can prairie out of it. Another issue I had is during the Alfheim challenges, I felt like the arena for some of them just isn't big enough. When you have issues such as enemies overcrowding a certain area, and then they can be on fire and all they have to do is touch you to take damage, you have to worry about enemies doing attacks from the distance. If the arena was bigger, you'll be able to fall back and reposition yourself to re-engage. Nonetheless, we need to move on to the next topic, which is what were my struggles completing my playthrough? Some overall chapters were hard, while only certain verses for certain chapters were hard. I will say though, completing the game on hard and getting all golds on hard was actually easier than getting all golds on normal. Obviously because I became way more acquainted with the game. Also, I will not be elaborating on which Alfheim challenges were harder just because I don't remember which chapter they were located in. There's so much I could talk about, but I really need to condense this. So let's get into the specifics and talk about the normal chapters that were hard. Chapter 5 on normal is actually very hard. This level feels like a marathon. There's so many hard enemies, there's so many things that can cheaply cause you to take damage to cause you not to get a gold. As you play the level, you will get beaten and worn down and have low health. Then you have to worry about these annoying flying snake things which have a multi-hitbox, charge attack, 
You can use the Gaze of Despair to make him attack more, to parry or witch time more. The way I dealt with it was after playing the level so many times, I just pre-planned to have I Fire Doraga instantly destroy his life bar for me. Turning into a crow and shooting your feathers at him is also a very strong strategy to do to avoid getting hit. And on top of everything, you will have to fight Jean at some point, I believe towards the end of the level. Chapter 8's intro is so annoying, you have to fight three joys on a highway, and it's cancer because you can't see the cards coming. If you can, at times, you're able to witch time them to use them to your advantage, but it's just really impossible with the camera angle. Most times. Following Chapter 8, Chapter 9 is also a hard chapter, and the reason it's hard is because there is a ball that consistently drops in the first section, and not only do you have to worry about that, while you're busting open chests, enemies pop out of the chest. If you're not ready for them, you will take damage. I bet everyone on their first time around took hella damage to the Doragas and all the strong enemies that were popping out of the chest. But once you're familiar with the enemies popping out of the chest and you have your prairie ability unlocked, this chapter becomes easy peasy lemon squeezy. Chapter 12, Broken Skies, is a short level, but it is hard because... It is a short level with not a lot of verses, and to qualify for a gold rank, you will need like 85% of the verses complete and golded to even qualify for an overall, an overall gold rank. So what makes this level hard in specifics is I believe the challenge Alfheim is actually hard at that level. I don't remember which one it is specifically. The level is filled with some pretty challenging enemies, so they might damage you and you might take too much damage to qualify for gold. And at the end of the level, you will have to fight Jean, which actually makes it so hard. But the main thing I want to highlight here is actually how hard it is to actually find the hidden verses on this level. There is three hidden verses, and there's one when you're on this like little will thing, but there's actually two other verses in the plane's turbines. And fighting the enemies where the plane turnbines are sucking you in is so annoying. A strategy I used was to use the butterfly things that allow you to take 5 hits and just run through the turnbines and have all the enemies come back there to fight you. And might I note how annoying it is that the turnbines can be busted by sliding with the rocket launcher this way, but upon entry you can't break them to find out that there's even a hidden verse over there. Hidden verses are also another reason which caused me to replay a lot of levels to find where the hidden verses were, or eventually I had to YouTube where some of these hidden verses were on levels because some of them are so well hidden that you'll randomly go back in the level to a random spot, kick over a trash can and an alpine portal opens, it's stuff like that. Which made me replay levels so many times and even when I goaded every available verse that I found normally, it wasn't enough to qualify for a gold rank. Chapter 14 was a super annoying level, and this is going to be my explanation for hard and normal. This is the level where you're on the rocket, and it's an aerial shooting level. And what makes this level so hard is it's so disorientating. It's like driving drunk or driving after you spun around in a very fast merry-go-round. To top it off, you can't really take that much damage to qualify for a gold rank on this level. And fighting this boss, I forgot what his name is, I'm gonna call him Tentacle Handman, y'all know who he is. I felt like it was very hard to find a wide space of attack while fighting him, it was always a short span of space he had to give. While trying to avoid not taking any damage from the other enemies shooting the green orbs. But what I found out when I played this level on hard that actually helped me out tremendously is you can actually mash the attack button and you shoot way more faster than you would if you just press and hold the button and shoot where she shoots at a consistent pace. But the cherry on top of this level which makes it so hard is after spinning your guts out and getting nauseous from doing all those barrel rolls is you have to fight Jean at the end of the level and not just regular Jean, her final form. John's last encounters in the game are just very annoying because she's very unpredictable. Her moves seem to come out of nowhere sometimes, and she flips around and she becomes intangible for a good amount of time, which is annoying. But to deal with her, there's a few ways. I recommend having a lot of meter and just having a good witch time or a good parry and a good combo to follow up. And Wicked Weave attacks to throw out her randomly to hit her down and make her tangible. 
Or maybe you can have the accessory that clones yourself so now you can do a lot of damage with a combo. That's always a nice option too. Chapter 15, Tower of Truth, is just a very hard level. It's a level where you fight majority of the previous bosses. Very challenging enemies everywhere, and once you get an adept understanding of the mechanics, you'll be able to fly through those enemies. A section I particularly found hard in this level, or well, normal and hard, it was when you're fighting the Tentacle Hand Man, I forgot his name, and he does his move where he does a solar flare, and it's, it seems unavoidable. I'm, on normal, I'm pretty sure you can hide behind this wall right here, but on hard, it will still make contact with you, which the only way to deal with that would be to get a perfectly timed dodge for which time, or maybe you can even parry it. I, I never tried to parry, so I don't know. Something that also helped me is you can actually witch time his rockets when they come close to you on the turret, and you'll be able to hop back into the turret and lay down more damage to get rid of them quicker. Now we're going to move on to where I talk about my struggles for my playthrough on hard mode. And in general, I would say the levels were not hard, but the Alfheim challenges definitely got harder. Enemies on hard mode definitely are more aggressive and they do attack way more frequently. It's funny because I think the hardest chapter on hard actually is the prologue. It's a contender for one of the hardest levels, but what really makes it hard is you can't really take that much damage. And there's a few challenging enemies, but the section that's really hard is where you have to perform three torture attacks in a row while fighting Duragas, and you can't use Witch Time because you're already slowed down. Another chapter I thought was hard on hard mode was chapter 4, which is a boss fight with Fort Tudio. He was definitely way more aggressive than I thought he'd be. He was fun to fight though, he was challenging. I think it took me two or three times to get gold while fighting him. Chapter 5 is just chapter 5. It's just a, gen a genuinely hard level. We already spoke about it before, so we're not going to speak on it again. Then we have chapter 7, which is a boss fight with the Tentacle Hand Man, which name is actually Temperan Tia. That's cute. What made him hard on hard mode is he had new moves in his moveset, and he had a lot of insta attacks. I had to learn the pattern with his new moveset so I would stop taking cheap, cheap damage from insta attack moves. You really can't take a lot of damage while fighting him, which is really why he's so hard combined with the insta attacks. You bet your sweet ass, chapter 8, route 666, was even harder than it was on normal. You gotta black him out and get something because you're gonna have to fight gracious and glorious on this highway instead of the joys. Even when you get a hang of this game, they put you into conditions where these enemies will really just fuck you up. I think this is definitely the worst verse of the game, if not definitely top 3. So we already know it's hard because of the cars, and what I did to get past this part was to fight on the shoulders where actually cars don't drive on. But sometimes these guys will push you to where you're not on the shoulder and you might run into a car. This verse is really just stage 4 cancer, like honestly. The Golden Brave at the end of the chapter is actually very challenging. I put him in a contender for a top 3 boss in this game. Since you can't use Witch Time because time is already slowed, he's just very aggressive and he's on your ass. I don't blame him though. He's just always aggressive and it's hard to find attack space while fighting him. Even though I did beat him on my first try once I reached him. Chapter 11, Cardinal of Virtue of Justice is the hardest boss in the game in my opinion. On hard, his aggression is amped to like 1000%, like he's not playing no games with you. The reason he's so hard is it's a lot to focus on if you're looking at everything going on in the screen. You want to watch out for his traps and then you're trying to make sure his seeds don't grow into plants. Then he has a really fast arm swipe that is very unpredictable. Even more, he has so much coverage in his moves, you can't even find opportunities to stop fighting him because there's so much going on to focus and look at. You can't take a lot of damage, and this guy took me about 10 tries to gold. This guy is a genuine hard boss fight. There's no gimmicks, just create your opportunity and go get him. Tower of Truth honestly isn't that hard on hard mode because you're adept to the game at that point, and you're really just fly through all those enemies that you thought were once challenging. Now I said I wasn't going to speak on the Alfheim challenges, but we're going to throw them into the retrospect anyways since they are like half the game if you actually do them. 
the ones that I struggled with usually had burning angels in them. I really don't remember the specifics. I can't tell you which chapter, which verse, and if it was on normal or hard. The Alfheim challenge that I thought was the worst and I struggled with the most was the out of body one with the flaming angels. What made this verse really hard was the angels can just stand by your bubble. They don't even have to attack it and then they can just burn it and you take damage or they can just straight up attack you. Finding space to spawn the bubble with its long animation is definitely a challenge with all the enemies that's on the screen. This challenge is the reason why I think the Alfheim arena is a little bit too small. It's so easy for enemies to just crowd around each other and to swing attacks through each other. And you can't even like be close to them because you're gonna get burned and take damage. It took me so many tries to get this verse complete. Using the pole dance attack and building Mildred to do torture attacks is how you're gonna get through this verse, but this verse was honestly really hell. If you made it this far into the video, I really appreciate that, and let's recap why Bayonetta is honestly one of the best games to ever exist. Bayonetta has superb mechanics that rewards players for challenging themselves by discovering the mechanics and mastering them. Replayability is the game's mechanism that drives the player to become adept at the mechanics. Bayonetta does not suffer from modern gaming tropes that have plagued gaming for quite some time now. You don't have to buy a battle pass. You don't have to buy skins. You don't have to buy weapons or weapon class slots. The freedom to play the game and the level of options that you have to do is so broad. There's so many things I still have an experiment with that I want to try out. Since Bayonetta is a straightforward closed game, you don't have to worry about things that cause people to face open world fatigue. I truly fell in love when I played Bayonetta, and a lot of people who play this game have a lot of praise to give to the game. However, I think this game is actually kind of underrated. This game does several things well, and you don't really hear people talk about the things that it does well in such depth, but at the same time, I don't be looking for people to talk about that type of stuff. One reason why I really love Bayonetta 2 is the very first time I played this game, it left me with all these gripes. However, when I replayed it and decided to dive deeper and explore the game a bit more, it had answers to almost all of my grapes, like 90% of them. Furthermore, since I played all three Bayonettas, I feel like Bayonetta 1 is the most fulfilling experience that the three games have to offer. But I do think Bayonetta 2 feels the best to play. Moving forward, I do think I'm going to play non-stop climax mode. At first I wasn't interested, but I'm not pressed on getting all golds. This is easily a game that you can keep replaying, which if you keep replaying a game, it just speaks on how good the game is. But this video has went on for quite too long and it's time to cut it off. So you guys already know what I'm about to say. Vibe out.